Okay, I think we should probably get going. So welcome everyone, wherever you are in the world. We time this to work for Europe and the Americas because um, it's very much a global project where we're working on uh, to, with the, as facilitators for the SSI, the Sustainable Shipping Initiative. My name is Will Dawson. I'm the um, lead for climate change at Forum for the Future. I'm joined by my colleague, Ian Watts, who also works on, on climate change as well. Um, and clearly this project is ultimately about uh, decarbonizing shipping for the uh, sake of, of um, tackling climate change. So that's what we're here talking about. We've got some uh, great contributors, um, which includes all of you. And so we're, we're keen to um, hear from you. We've got some set piece people to, that we've asked a fair few thoughts and slides up front um, to get us going. So I'd like now just to hand over to Andrew Stevens, the Executive Director of Sustainable Shipping Initiative, just to say a few words as host of the um, webinar and the inquiry that we're in the midst of about SSI and that process. Lovely, thank you, Will. Welcome everybody, and uh, good morning and good afternoon, as Will said, from around the world. We are very, very pleased that you can participate and help in what we are about to hear and learn around the issue uh, that we are taking a dive into, which is what role, if any, biofuels plays in shipping and its endeavor for radical decarbonization. The SSI is a member-led organization and we're 15 members and uh, we are pursuing here uh, a multi-stakeholder debate and discussion around this topic. So we are engaging with many across the industry and different sectors, IGOs, uh, etc. Um, to pull together uh, the various perspectives of what we need to understand and take further forward in our research in this area and in particular what role, if any, as I said, biofuels plays in the alternatives uh, that may realize for, for shipping going forwards. This stems from a a report that we commissioned in early 2018, which was put together for us by Lloyd's Register and UMass, and was about zero emission vessels. Um, both of those have taken that further forward subsequently into the transition pathways. Uh, we have picked out biofuels as one of the likely and viable alternatives, and your views and perspectives are, are very important to us. This is the third in a series of seminars that we have run. And this leads up to a high level event that we will run during Climate Week in New York in September. And post that, we will put all our research and what we have heard and learned into a report which will be published by the end of the year. So again, thank you very much for uh, participating. I look forward to a very healthy debate and our colleagues and member Forum for the Future as Will and Ian have introduced themselves, are going to be hosting and running this webinar. So back to you, Will. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that warm introduction. And um, so I'm just going to do a bit of housekeeping before we get going with speakers. Um, first thing you might realize from, I think it's probably on all your screens, certainly on mine as host, is that it says recording. Um, we would like to record this and um, put it onto the SSI's website for people to be able to view later. Um, so just to kind of make sure everyone's aware of that, if you have any issues with that at all, then please um, be in contact with myself and we can, we can make a change to that. Um, we did think about how people would be able to speak openly on this. So if there's any point or question you would like to raise or ask that you don't want to have recorded as coming from yourself, then you can um, be very welcome to use the chat function and um, switch it to rather to everyone to me on there and send me a private message from that and I will relay it anonymously um, to the webinar um, so that helps with uh, anonymization and 
if you click on participants down the bottom of your screen, if you want it, so when we get into discussion, you can like wave, raise hand. That will help me to see out of the um, 29 participants we've got currently who would like to speak. We very much want everyone to, who wants to contribute to, to do so, whether that's a question or a comment, or we're going to ask you a question after the, the first set of contributors have, have, have um, delivered their presentations. So this is very much a discussion we'd like to get going um, rather than just a, a listen in. So you're very welcome to do that. And if you would like otherwise to um, pose a question, do use the chat channel as well, um, ideally to everyone. But if you again, if you want to make it anonymous, you can do so directly to me. Great. So uh, just as a little warm up exercise, during the first two in-person seminars that we've run on this topic so far, we've asked everyone um, a question, on, uh, several questions, three in fact, to be precise. So via the polling system that uh, Zoom allows, I'm going to post up questions on your screen and invite you to answer those. Um, so you should have on front of you now three questions, which are kind of your thoughts on biofuels for shipping. This is anonymous, so um, we won't be able to record who said what, but we'll get the kind of graphical result, which I'll post up in a couple of minutes once you've had a think about these. So the first one is, on a scale from one to five, how supportive are you regarding, regarding the use of biofuels in shipping from not at all to very? Um, and then it's next two are really about your forecasts for how much of the energy used in shipping will come from biofuels in, at two points in the future. The first one is 2030 and the second one is 2050. So great, I can see some answers coming into those. I won't tell you what they are, so not prejudice your uh, responses. Okay, great. So I've had just over 20 responses to the first question. Let's give it a few more minutes to answer. Some big questions in there to ask you to think about very quickly. Okay, great. Is anyone, anyone, raise your hand if you want to a little bit more time. We've had 21 out of 28. That's very good. Thank you very much. Appreciate some people might not want to respond. So that's fine as well. It's not obligatory. I don't know if you, who you are in a way. So <laughs> it doesn't matter at all. Okay, great. 21 of you responded. So that's three quarters. So I'm going to now end the poll. Um, five, four, three, two, one. For any last answers? Okay, here we go. So what have we got? I think, uh, let me go back to someone like, Ian, can you see that? Can you see the results? Oh, share results. There we go. Okay. Uh, yes. no, no, I can. Yes. So now you should be able to see what people have said. It's okay. Great. So um, it's fair to say you're on the, those who did respond are on the, um, the in on the fence or towards the, very supportive angle on this issue. Um, and then let's look at the, uh, the forecast for 2030 and 2050. So most popular answers for 2030 are at the 10%, 5% point. One answer for none at all, I think. Yeah, that's right, yeah, one person. Uh, and the highest we had by look of it was 25%. Okay, so a nice little histogram there around the 5 10% mark for 2030. And then as we move forward to 2050, we've got no one now with zero, presuming the same person answered both questions. They've, they've moved up. So it looks like a shift up basically in terms of the amount. Uh, the highest is 75%. Interesting, very interesting. And um, 
most popular being 10% again, but around it, people shifting. So that's a very interesting result. I'd say uh, those who were in one of our other, well, in-person seminars, that is high, uh, a higher amount. And interestingly, shifting up to 2050, those in the seminars tended to go down from 2030 to 2050 as if um, there was a kind of peaking of use of biofuels which started to wane as we hit the mid-century or towards the mid-century. Um, that could be a that more folks here from the Americas, I don't know, and more folks there from, from the European environment. Uh, who knows? That's, that's very helpful data for us, so thank you for that. We have, have a think about your answers for that and um, yeah, as we get into discussions, maybe you could, you could tell us why you answered that way and what chimed or didn't from the contributors we're about to hear from. So we've got three speakers who are just going to kick things off for us. One of them I know very well is, as I said, my colleague Ian Watt from Forum for the Future. Uh, he's going to give us basically a reflection from the first two seminars. The first one was on the sustainability issues associated with the use of biofuels in shipping. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing those poll results. They come off your screen now. But we've, we've got those saved um, for our, our, our use. As I said, they're anonymized. Um, to Ian, yes, the first one was on sustainability and the second one was on availability issues. So Ian's going to kick off with that. Then we're going to hear from Wang Rong Zhu from the International Clean Council for Clean Transportation. And then we're going to hear from Gerard Ostheimer from the Under 50 program, which is part of the Well Business Council for Sustainable Development. And then we're going to open up to everyone to be able to be part of the discussion, either asking questions, responding to points, adding your own thoughts to um, a question that we're going to pose to you on the back of these. So, um, Ian, do you want to kick us off then? Will do. Thanks, Will. Uh, and thanks everyone else for that poll. It does seem to me that what, what I'm planning to do uh, is offer you the insights that we think we have gained from the two seminars we've had thus far. As Will says, it does seem that we have a slightly different set of attitudes today than we have had then. Um, but we are very much still in listening mode. So what the plan with my presentation wasn't to say we've made up our mind in any way. It was just to sort of say what we think we have heard thus far. So we are completely open to people challenging this or quizzing it or questioning it. So that will be the framing for my piece. But these are really just insights from the first two seminars. Um, now, can I move this forward? Um, has that switched, Will? Can people yes. see insights one? Right. I've broken my first rule of PowerPoint presenting by giving you uh, a completely text dense slide. I have three of them uh, and I'm going to try not to, <laughs> not to read directly off them. Uh, but these are uh, the comments thus far. Right. Let's see. Um, in some ways, similar to the poll we've just heard, what we have heard from the stakeholders is that very few people, actually no one in the first two seminars, uh, we're speculating that biofuels would dominate the shipping sector either in a 2030 to 2050 timeframe. Now, there are a variety of reasons there, but that itself is a significant finding and, and also one that is possibly being questioned by some people in the, I think there are some people uh, today who are a bit more bullish about that. So that will be interesting to, to flesh out uh, over the course uh, of this webinar. Um, however, even though we do have people sort of saying we don't, they don't think it would dominate, uh, certainly a good number of stakeholders supporting some role for biofuels moving forwards. And my third slide will flesh out what we think we have heard thus far on that. Um, third point, at the risk of being blindingly obvious, uh, biofuels remain reasonably controversial um, in the world of sustainability. Um, and it's the indirect the knock-on, the substitution, the hard to track, and in many ways, the hard to measure issues that raise the most flags. We are continually hearing a lot about indirect land use change. And increasingly, we're starting to hear about uh, the lost opportunity uh, that might come from dedicating land to, uh, to growing biofuels, that particularly as we look to natural climate solutions to help us with carbon sequestration, there might be a future conflict there as to what we might use our, our mm -hmm. land, land for. Um, given those issues, uh, from what we've heard thus far, the greatest stakeholder comfort 
comes from uh, utilizing wastes or residues as feedstocks. Uh, but there's also quite a lot of concern about the fact that there's only so much waste residue uh, to go around. However, we have heard voices arguing that in regions that have good land governance systems in place, it absolutely is possible in certain situations to utilize either purpose-grown feedstocks or possibly even in diverted food feedstocks. Um, what is tricky is for the time being, uh, it can be hard to identify such regions. And there was also a sense that the existing governance mechanisms and certification schemes that, that are in play aren't yet able to answer some of those landscape level challenges and aren't yet able to answer all of the questions that some of the stakeholders we're engaging with are posing. Um, so that's one lesson I think we've gained for the shipping sector is that there's not a simple off the shelf solution that the shipping sector can embrace. That if we only utilize feedstock X or if we only utilize feedstock X from region A or if we only utilize uh, fuels that come through a certain certification scheme we're not yet at the stage where every stakeholder is comfortable with that uh, at a full level of comfort. Um, however, in as much as we have reached out to those involved in, in, in certification schemes and governance mechanisms, I think there's quite a lot of awareness within those groups of this sort of landscape scale challenge. Uh, and I think there's quite a lot of effort within those initiatives to start, uh, start incorporating those issues. And I would even say a, a reasonable degree of confidence that we will be able to tackle some of them. Um, moving forward. Um, so that's really the points we're making in this slide. My second slide is more informed by the conversation we had around availability and sustainability, but the two issues are clearly very interlinked. Um, first obvious point is that there is clearly significant variation if you look at the various studies out there as to how much feedstock might become available moving forward. Uh, there wasn't in that seminar uh, quite a lot of agreement that uh, estimates that take us certainly significantly beyond the idea of 100 exajoules per annum can actually be discounted as practically unfeasible. Um, now, and just to let you know, uh, if we look, um, if you look at projections of aviation's potential demand out to 2050, 100 exajoules is roughly equivalent to that. And some of the estimates I've seen within the shipping sector takes shipping to around 25 or 30 exajoules per annum. Now, clearly there's a lot of uncertainty around future projections, but that's the sort of ballpark that we are, uh, we are talking about. Um, and also while lots of people felt that those large numbers beyond that uh, felt just practically unrealistic, there was also, uh, on the other hand, a fair degree amongst the stakeholder group we had in the room of, of confidence that provided there was a major societal effort that we could see uh, availability of the order of uh, 50 exajoules per annum becoming available. However, um, that, that would not just be available for, sh for shipping, uh, it's available to all potential competing uses uh, and industries. Um, a case could be made for shipping to have access but if you look at projections for decarbonizing society moving forward, very few of the academic bodies or the governmental bodies that are looking at how you might use that limited resource seem to be prioritizing shipping. Uh, if it goes to a fuel, it tends to be that aviation gets, gets a priority, uh, but there's also a number of projections moving forward where the, there's a sense that it actually perhaps shouldn't be used as a fuel at all. But if we can find societal uses where it is stored, in materials that might be better than releasing it uh, through carbon. Uh, so that's maybe a cautionary point as towards uh, future availability. Um, uh, the other key point that came out, there, there was a sense that while the best biofuels do offer significant carbon benefits over bunker fuels and the fuels that are used in shipping, uh, that they enable lower carbon rather than zero carbon shipping. And there was a sense among the stakeholders we've spoken to thus far that certainly as we look out towards a 2040, 20, 2050 20, timeframe, that shipping should be aspiring to be uh, fully decarbonized rather than better than today. Um, so just moving on to the third slide, that led us into this, a really interesting discussion at a second seminar where we had a number of people advocating for the need for new ships 
that were coming online from around 2030 onwards should be zero carbon, uh, and thus that they were likely to rely on a new host biofuel technology for, for their primary propulsion. Now that in itself, it, there's no guarantees that that would come to fruition. The people who were suggesting that we needed that to happen were strongly arguing that there would need to be a big push uh, both within governmental circles and within shipping circles and perhaps beyond fuel circles more broadly to, to enable that to happen. Um, however, that does not mean that people were saying there would not be an ongoing role for biofuels. There was a strong sense that as a drop-in solution for existing ships already on the market, that biofuels could and should be playing an important role. And that means they would continue to play a role probably out to a 2050 timeframe. It is just that new vehicles, new, new ships coming online in 2030 would likely be turning elsewhere. Um, and so that led to what we actually sort of flipped the main question that we were posing on, uh, on availability. And um, that perhaps rather than being focused on will there be sufficient biofuel for a major push towards biofuels as a fuel for shipping in the long term, it actually became will there be sufficient biofuel in the short term uh, to enable ships to get rapidly, uh, to, to rapidly take themselves away from using bunker fuel. So it actually becomes more of an interesting question around uh, increasing demand in the short term uh, rather than the long term. And that led to this last point that I, I wanted to make here was just that regardless of the long term role for biofuels, much as back, if we go back to point 13, that to come up with post biofuel solutions will require a huge uh, societal push. There seems to be a clear sense that even for a functioning bioeconomy to take place, regardless of whether uh, that produces biofuels for shipping, there also needs to be a large push from society uh, within the next few years. And that there could and should be a role for the maritime industry to play a constructive role for that, even if uh, biofuels don't end up being the long-term solution for the sector. So I'm going to stop there. Again, those were the key insights we got from uh, two in-person seminars with a specific group of, of stakeholders uh, and just putting them out there for the time being uh, as provocation to get your reaction and, and, and questions around that. Great. Thank you very much for that, Ian. We're going we're gonna to hear from all three speakers um, before we open up for discussion. If you've got any questions that start coming to mind already, then please do pop them in. I can see one um, coming through, so thanks for that. So next up, we're going to have Wan Rong Zhu. Wang Rong, hello. Thank you very much for joining us and for uh, being one of our first contributors to the webinar. Um, we tested earlier if you would like to share your screen and, and, and share your thoughts and presentation with us, that would be tremendous. Hi, can Hi. everyone see the slide? I can see them, yes, thank you. Okay. If you just Fantastic. want to introduce yourself as well and just very briefly on your role, that would be sure, sure. helpful for people and yourself. Sure, yeah. Um, thank you, Ian and Will, for organizing the webinar, and thank you for having me speaking at this webinar. So I am Yue Rong Zhou, an associate researcher of the FUELS program at the International Council on Clean Transportation. So today I will just briefly talk about three key factors that um, we should all keep in mind when evaluating biofuel or any other alternative fuels as the potential solution for sustainable shipping. So the, quest, the first question we need to ask is whether biofuel could bring the true environmental benefits regarding reductions in both GHG and other pollutants. So to answer this question, it's really necessary to do a full life cycle analysis of the fuels, starting from feedstock production and all the way to the combustion stage. So in this figure here, we are comparing the carbon intensity of biofuels produced from the rice feedstocks to fossil fuel. And these are the values that are used for regulations in the US and the EU. And we can see that certain biofuels do not necessarily provide GHG reduction benefits, especially the food-based biofuels. And this is because of the direct and indirect land use change associated with them. So meaning that using certain feedstock to produce biofuel might divert their use in other industries, 
leading to the expansion of crop plants to produce these specific feedstocks or other substitute feedstocks. But um, in general, residues and wastes could provide greater cl climate benefits, but um, one needs to make sure that those are purely wastes with no additional usage. So for example, many people consider that used cooking oil is a kind of waste, but it actually can be um, used in, feedstock, in livestock feed in the US. So therefore using used cooking oil in biofuel is likely to result in less amount available in livestock feed, which then um, that amount may have to be backfilled by other types of feedstocks such as corn, and that may um, require more production of corn and leading to land use emissions, land use change emissions. And here I am only showing the carbon emissions, but in terms of other pollutants, um, it is generally agreed that biofuels tend to have low sulfur content, but there are still debates on their NOx content. So whether biofuels could really be compliant with the environmental regulations defined by IMO or other regulations is still in question. And the second, we should evaluate how practical it is to use biofuels in shipping. And one consideration is um, the availability of feedstocks. So as, as it is facing like multiple um, competitions, and first, as mentioned, um, certain biomass can be used in many different sectors, such as food, industrial, and power sector. And second, there is the competition within the transportation sector itself, meaning that um, whether to produce biofuels to meet the need of road transportation or aviation or marine. So our team made a rough estimation of the maximum available um, low carbon biomass that could be supplied for various uses in 2050 and how it is likely to be divided among different uses. And we estimate that the amount of available sustainable biomass is unlikely to decarbonize all of the marine fuel because of the competitions from other sectors. And if we only look at the transportation itself, the road sector is likely to use the majority of the bioenergy because um, it is uh, cheaper to replace fossil fuels with biomass than um, in the aviation or the marine sector. And in- Just to, to step in, I'm, I'm still only seeing your first slide here. Oh, and really? I think you might be on the, you might be expecting us to see the second slide at this stage, is that correct? Yes. Ah, That's there right. we go. I can see okay. it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. That's... Yeah, so um, in this estimation, we are actually um, assuming aggressive vehicle electrification. But ha however, um, if we are not able to um, keep up with the ambitious electrification, then the availability left for the marine sector is probably going to be lower than the estimation here. And so that's um, the feedstock availability. But in addition to that, there are also some other issues in terms of practicality, uh, including commercialization and compatibility with the existing infrastructures and engines. So for example, many advanced biofuels do not have the mature system supply chain in place. And also the physical properties of biofuels are different from the conventional marine fuels. So that posed questions for fuel storage and combustion as well. And the third element is the cost. Um, whether low carbon fuels are cost competitive, otherwise people won't use them at all. So our team has previously analyzed the, the minimum viable price of various fuels and this reflects the fuel price that is necessary for an investment in a given fuel conversion technology to reach its targeted rate of return. Um, so in this figure here, we use the jet fuel price as the baseline, but we all know that bunker fuel is normally cheaper than jet fuel. So the key message here that is um, 
all these alternative fuels are very ex expensive, much more expensive than the conventional fuels. And usually more um, sustainable fuels are generally more expensive since they would require um, higher upfront investment. So in conclusion, um, to understand whether biofuels or any other kinds of alternative fuels that could be the solution for sustainable shipping, it requires um, comprehensive evaluations, including the three elements that I've talked today. And from what our team has seen, um, it is unlikely to decarbonize the marine sector purely from biofuel. And we think it is also necessary to um, improve the vessel efficiency while exploring the opportunities from alternative fuels. So yeah, so th that's all from me and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Rongwu. Um, we, uh, it's really interesting and touched on some of the points, um, actually some of the points we are having contributed for this, the chat function as well. So I'm sure we can return to elements like uh, cost uh, in the discussion. So thank you very much indeed. We're going to hear now from Gerard Ostheimer from the um, Under 50 project uh, as part of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. So Gerard, if you'd like to share your screen and take us to your presentation, that would be great. Thank you. And do say any words of introduction to yourself that you would like to add. Sure, uh, it's a pleasure. Um, I'm not sure what everybody else is seeing from my screen. At the moment, we can see you, but I your, your PowerPoint program with your mouse okay. moving on it. Great. So okay. maybe you just need to start this. Love slide show. There we go. Excellent. Great, thank you. Um, right, so I want to discuss very briefly how the world has changed since the Paris Agreement. And uh, one of the changes, as you mentioned, is our program called Below 50. It's not under 50, it's called Below 50. And that refers to, uh, we are a group of which I'm the managing director that seeks to promote uh, fuels that reduce emissions by greater than 50%. And so clearly there is a debate out there in the energy transition space between um, stakeholders who want to get to zero everything and those that want to make progress. And uh, we, we uh, feel that uh, dropping by 50% is a very good step in the run up to 2030. And then uh, we envision uh, systemic and systematic changes that will eventually, eventually allow us to go below 50, below 70, below 90. Um, uh, down to uh, a, a genuinely net zero society, but transportation and fuels are not going to do that uh, alone and independently. So uh, I want to just make a few points. One is that it's been fascinating to watch over the last five years how there is an evolving policy to action ecosystem. I want to talk about the expansion in the transportation sector around that. Um, I want to the, the, the screens are occluding my text. Um, I want to point out that a concerted, systematic, and systemic effort is needed to scale up the bioeconomy and renewable fuels. Um, ideally, we will start to see additional renewable fuels not from biomass come online. So fuels that leverage, um, quote unquote, free electrons uh, that can uh, drive, uh, essentially drive combustion backwards uh, we'd like to see the price point on that come down, uh, which reminds me to mention that below 50 itself is not a biofuel promoter per se. We are a low carbon fuel promoter and we are technology agnostic. We feel that all technologies that, are, uh, that have strong LCA and that have um, strong approaches to uh, producing fuels at scale should be promoted. And then lastly, I, I uh, would like to point out that the private sector is in a position to uh, increasingly drive the uptake of low carbon fuels. And I would argue that SSI is, is a case in point in that. So SSI has um, a number of private sector actors, both on the, the very downstream side, people that do the shipping, 
uh, excuse me, people that uh, ship, that have products they wish shipped, and then the shippers themselves are private sector actors that can lead in this space. And that did not advance my slide, but this did. Okay, so looking back very briefly in, in time, uh, biofuels came on, came on to the scene in a very linear way. So what you had was a situation where trade groups agri in the US, largely agricultural groups, in Brazil, it was largely a military junta. In Europe, it was uh, uh, different uh, stakeholders. Uh, interestingly, I think more on the environmental side. Trade groups and interest groups pressured the national government to decarbonize transport. The first generation options of ethanol and biodiesel were put into, so the demand was created by an enforced, legally enforced biofuel mandate. So in the US, if you don't actually do the blending you're supposed to, you go to jail and people have gone to jail. And the result is that you had a linear source of demand for the fuel. The problem is, is that this is, as most linear systems are, this is potentially quite fragile. It's very dependent on public support. And what we've seen since 2008 is that uh, some NGOs, not all, but some NGOs and some oil companies have worked to erode public support which has caused great confusion and policy uncertainty within national governments. And so what we need is a much more robust system. And what we need is far more public understanding for the progress that has been made in bringing these fuels online, the progress that has been made in understanding their sustainability, which brings me to my next point, which is that since Paris, we've had this um, proliferation of groups that are engaged on this topic. The International Energy Agency, SSI itself, below 50, the Biofuture Platform. These add to groups like the Global Bioenergy Partnership, like the International Energy Agency Technical Cooperation Partnership on Bioenergy. We have Mission Innovation, which is uh, looking at trying to catalyze further, further advances. And so what we have is we have a number of players that are chipping away at this. And I, I want to make two points. One is I congratulate SSI for trying to for taking the time to listen, not uh, trying to do this all on your own, but pulling in the inputs from these groups. And so these groups have, have um, tremendous technical resources and tremendous technical experience. And so I really uh, admire SSI for taking the time to pull in the input from these groups and to, to think deeply and to leverage all of the work that has been done. Sustainability of biomass is something that people have been working on actually for 30 plus years, because it actually traces back all the way to the sustainable forestry initiative. And so there's a lot that we can, that lot that we have incorporated for, from sustainable forestry. And now uh, since uh, 2006 and seven, where there was a big push on renewable fuels and biofuels, a lot of work has been done. And I, and I, uh, I commend SSI for, for trying to absorb and, uh, and incorporate that work. And uh, you know, with apologies, I should actually have the ICCT logo on there, I'm sorry. So the question is, what more can we do to increase sustainable low carbon fuel demand? So the, the yellow square is asking, what can we do? And more importantly, can we leverage all of the expertise that's out there? And so what we're seeing is that there is a way to do this. And I think that one of the linchpins is actually corporate demand. And so we live in a, we live in a political time where there's a lot of very complicated issues and there's not a lot of leadership on the climate, in the climate space. Where we are starting to see more leadership is in, from the private sector, from corporate demand, corporate mediated demand, but that corporate demand is, is in, in a great uh, sense being motivated by consumers. And so what the vision that we in Below 50 have is that corporate demand can first of all create demand on the, for the fuels, which will recruit uh, subsequent investment. But what we think is that if consumers see companies that they trust, Starbucks, Walmart, Carrefour, H&M, they see them leading on this uh, decarbonizing transportation space, then that provides an outstanding opportunity to educate people at the consumer level of the benefits of low carbon fuels. And of course, this is all with the proviso that we are um, using the best possible fuels and that we are making um, progress on understanding the issue of sustainability. 
And if I could, I, I'll just take another minute to make a few remarks in light of the recent IPCC report. And so recently uh, IPCC came out, they made a report highlighting the fundamental role of landscapes in a low carbon sustainable future. Okay. I've seen the report, I've worked with people before the, uh, the report was released and the report is schizophrenic. The report has headlines, so headers of paragraphs that are follow the European model, extremely cautious, precautionary principle, biofuels uh, create all kinds of risk. And though, and, but then if you actually read the text, the text is actually quite reasonable. And it says, well, and we've thought about this and we've worked on this and we have solutions and, and we have approaches to I look, et cetera. And, and so the problem is that I think people are looking at the headers and they're not picking up on the actual text of the document, which is actually um, sort of neutral to positive. But the, what a point that I wanna make is the world is understanding that climate is a systemic and systematic challenge that mm -hmm. we need to address through landscape management. And I am finishing. We need to address through landscape management. Simultaneously, we are entering a new era of landscape scale data. GIS is getting to be a much stronger tool. People are understanding the need for monitoring um, soil carbon, soil moisture, et cetera, using data. And so I think that we are approaching a, a point where there, there is this transition that's going to happen, obviously first in the global north, but moving into the global south, of leveraging landscapes for carbon sequestration, leveraging landscapes for um, social benefit and uh, uh, economic benefit, leveraging purpose-grown crops, trees, whatever you want to get renewable carbon that's available for a genuine circular economy, and that this is going to be driven by data. And there are, are participants on this call like RSB and others, uh, IEA Bioenergy, who are experts in this data, that are experts of thinking about this and modeling this. And so that brings us, well, what's the point of SSI, right? I mean, if S how is SSI going to wade into this global transition in the use of landscapes? And SSI doesn't have to manage it. SSI doesn't have to lead it per se, but SSI just needs to set the signal of sustainable biomass is available and we want it. And I think that that, mar that signal, that's, that market signal will go a long way to pulling in the investment in the sustainable practices in the global south that will realize I don't know if we're on our second or third green revolution, I forget, but it will realize the transition that we made where we bring um, degraded land into production, degraded land to sequester carbon, degraded land to provide the feedstocks for the fuels that can be so beneficial. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to be on this call. I, I thank you for being a captive audience and I mm -hmm. will um, stop speaking. Thank you so much, Joe. You can contact me. Contact there. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. That was a really, uh, again, three very enlightening contributions to start us off from different aspects, working really nicely together. And we've got some um, points coming through from others on the webinar already. So um, let me just pull those up. We've got, so please do, um, so I'll just come to, uh, so look, Lavinia as well, I think you, you, we spoke before and you had some comments to make too, which would be helpful if you want to, if you want to go ahead and give your point of views as well, that'd be, that'd be great. And we've got some coming in on the chat as well. Do you ever think about what you'd like to say? Uh, we've got a question here, which we wanted to pose a stimulus to, which is asking you about your top concerns or hopes regarding the sustainability of biofuels and their potential use in the shipping industry. So um, there we are. Yeah, Lavinia, do you, I, I know you had some connection issues. If, you're, if you are with us and able to contribute, then, then welcome. And thank you for joining us. Yeah. Uh, okay. Can you, can, can you all hear me? Can you it, hear me? It, yes, we can. It was just a little bit broken up to start okay. with for me, but have a go. Uh, 
Okay, so just a, um, a quick comment. Um, I mentioned to you my main concern from the Brazilian perspective is obviously the mainstream land use, indirect land use. Uh, but I would add to that the fact that um, in Brazil, well, I would say that we do need to engage private sector and make sure they can commit to sustainable practices. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not hoping to see uh, many, you know, positive movements from the government. So I would say that my main point from the Brazilian perspective is how to engage the private sector and make sure that they are, um, you know, committed to producing biofuels and making sure that this is a sustainable production. So apart, apart from everything that I heard, which I pretty much agree, my main concern in Brazil is, is how this is going to affect, you know, land use in Brazil. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I think the private sector has a big role to play uh, in helping, you know, our increased production to be, you know, in our current production to be sustainable. So that Great. would be my main comment. Thank you very much. And, and I should have asked you at the start of that, but if you could just say who, um, it, what your role is in the organization or well, organizations are part of that would be great as well for people to benefit. Uh, yeah, I work with our Instituto Clima e Sociedade. Um, I am a person who is representing Instituto Clima e Sociedade in, um, in the shipping discussion. Mm -hmm. I was part of the Brazilian delegation as an observer. Um, and, and it's, uh, well, I'm trying to work with um, the Navy in Brazil, who is the um, it's organization responsible for representing Brazil at IMO. Okay. Uh, I have to say that it's very hard for, for it's very new to them to have, you know, uh, NGOs or observers from civil society. So the mm -hmm. very fact that I'm part of the delegation is a, a, a new situation. Um, you know, it's been like this for the past two years or so. So, um, yeah. Great. Well, that sounds like an encouraging step, and I, I, could, I uh, thank you for sharing that insight on your role. Yeah. That's really interesting. And and on the international on on the indirect land use change and the role of the private sector in the supply chain as well. Thank you for that. I'm going to turn now to um, the contributors coming through. It's great if you can post by text first. It helps me to kind of uh, understand what's coming. Um, very nice feature. But uh, yeah, so it, Stephen, I think you, you made the first point, Stephen, from the RSB. Hello, we had you at um, one of our um, seminars and your colleague at another. So you made a couple of points um, during the presentations. Do you want to expand on those? Or just um, say who you are and, 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 and then make, uh, say your question or comment? Hi, thanks. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, right, super. Um, I'm actually going to leave that comment because you've already have it there. Um, I just on the Brazilian side, I've just had the luxury of spending two weeks with Mark and other colleagues at WWF. Um, I'm uh, the director of business development for Roundtable and Sustainable Biomaterials. Um, the encouraging element, in, particularly in the Brazilian space, is there's 38 million hectares of degraded land that needs to come back into circulation, uh, which is not apt for primary food production, but would be very apt for a variety, old uh, traditional varieties of uh, sugar, uh, energy sugar and, uh, and other forms of crops that would alleviate a lot of land use change in the Brazilian space. Um, and then there's a particular Renov, uh, Renov, what's it, Renov, Renov Bio, uh, Renova BU, yes. That's it, with a great incentive space. I think that really needs an uptake uh, in, that, in that environment. But I agree with you, the Lavinia, the uh, industry itself, uh, very mature, 40, 50 years old, uh, needs to be cleaned up in terms of its sustainable, sustainability practices before it looks to expand uh, any further. And in your space, I would say it's going to land up in a tank of a of a uh, jet or actually first and foremost in a, in a vehicle, ground transport, um, given the, the kind of political uh, and, and long-term investments of Braskem and others. 
Globally, though, there's, there's enough feedstock if we're looking to diversify. And I think the shipping industries uh, can play even a stronger role in the aviation space, given their broader ge geographical uh, positions and the fact that they can actually transport their own fuel uh, whilst the aviation sector cannot. It uses exactly what it needs when it, when it, when it moves from one craft to the next. Um, and then Gerald, I think, has uh, hit on perfectly. We need to not look for incentive schemes around fuel, fueling and so forth, but how we can create partnerships between industries uh, within the private sector. Um, historically, and I think Brazil and other places can still do a lot from a government perspective like the navies uh, to stimulate economies. But uh, that's not going to help the shipping industry if, it, uh, if they don't start working hand in hand. It, you know, if we learn from America, it helped the military for the first few years, but um, the, the private sector stood on the sidelines for too long, I think last five, six years. Um, so I think as we move to other forms and other places in the world, we should uh, look to see how we can collectively stimulate the market. With the precursor, I'm one of those people that said no more than 10%. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Stephen. And Chester uh, from E4 Tech. Hello, and um, thank you for joining us. I saw a comment you mentioned about cost, and given that Stephen's uh, not spoken to that point, it kind of leaves the floor clear for you if you wanted to build on it, as you said. I can bring you off mute if you No, it's fine. I'm just finding the button. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, he hello, everyone. Um, my name is Chester Lewis. I'm from E4Tech, who are a, a consultancy in sort of the biofuel space, but m more generally the sustainable energy space. So we are also technology agnostic, um, which is important to note. But um, my particular role here at E4Tech, um, I work a lot on low carbon fuels, zero emission fuels. Um, and particularly in, in, in the shipping area um, most recently. So no, it was really just a flag and building off of Stephen's point there. Um, as you move past this, this general question of availability and sustainability and move more into the economics um, and, and sector by sector, um, obviously when you're looking at a lot of the information coming out of academia, um, uh, governmental modeling and stuff like that. Biomass is used um, in one for sort of power power generation and and in a lot of them in BECs. But also when you move it into fuels, it's, it it moves into the aviation sector. And and a lot of people have a firm belief that the av av aviation sector has has, um, for want of a better term, first first dibs on. On, on biomass for fuel. Um, so really it was just raising the points and opening it up for discussion um, on on once you move past that, the economics of it, because once you look at how you incentivize bringing in biofuels in, into a sector like shipping, you're looking at the general stru structures that are already in place. And w when you look at something like, you know, RED or RED2, for example, which has, has multipliers to try and get biofuels on a competing level in aviation um, with cu the current sectors that um, these biofuels move into at the moment, such as road, which has, has a much higher price point because of taxes, etc. So a lot more room to play with. Um, but when you, you compare the aviation industry with the shipping industry, you suddenly see the shipping industry has a much lower price point. Um, and really, it's going to come down to, to the delta, the difference between the, the fossil incumbents and the biofuels on offer. I think that's a really important question that you, we need to grapple with um, in, in terms of how we move forward and, and if there's a role for biofuels to play in the shipping sector. Thank you, Chester. That was a um, very useful contribution. It chimes with um, some of the discussion we had at the availability seminar as well in London at the IMO, um, which was talking to that point and looking at the role of carbon pricing or other policy mechanisms which may actually close that delta by making fossil fuels more expensive. Um, so, um, 
Is anyone else online? I'm uh, just catching up with the conversation. Um, any other points that anyone wanted to make? You can just come off mute or, or raise your hand. Um, Blair, you made a point, but it looks like Gerard's come back to you on the chat. So um, an interesting discussion going on there about different roles of policy and, um, and private sector. Did you want to add to that? If no one's taking up the space, can I add something? Yes, please do. Okay. Uh, it, for me, it's often uh, what I, you know, everyone says agnostic feedstock, agnostic end results and so forth, but uh, that's great. But I often find that conversations are still binary and thinking that um, when you're producing a biofuel for aviation sector, that's all you're doing. If you're producing plastics, bioplastics, that's all you're doing. But in essence, you're not. Those involved in the bioeconomy, when you're producing a biojet fuel, you'll have a waste stream that would be ideal for, for a shipping space, would be ideal for making ethylene um, into plastics and even making some tars that'll land up in your pavement. Um, so there's not a, a, a one issue thing. So if you're busy generating a biofuel or stimulating a biofuel for jets, you can comfortably also be having a 5, 10, 15% offtake for a shipping space. Why it's important for industries not to, to stop talking to themselves, just the aviation, just the car manufacturers, just the plastic guys, which every time I go to a bio conference is the case. Um, there isn't such a thing as a bioeconomy or a different form of economy. There's only one. And similarly in the, in the space, we've got a, find ways and who else is making, whose waste is my, my benefit. Um, and when you start doing that, we also get away from this math and, and science where we um, qualify and quantify the amount of energies available for, a, for aviation or for shipping or for cars and not realizing that actually the production of that is all interrelated. I hope that made sense. It did. Thank you, Stephen. Um, uh, I'd like to come in on that point after Stephen. Thank you, Joe. Just please do. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and, and building upon that is the idea that uh, biorefineries don't have to be static. So biorefineries can start off producing a jet fuel or a um, shipping fuel. And they could evolve over time with subsequent investment, obviously, but they could, once you have, the hard part is getting the logistics set up to bring in the feedstock, initial processing of the feedstock. But then once you have either a cellulose stream or a sugar stream or a lignin stream, or whatever your different streams are, you can orient them in different ways, whether you're going to go through a thermochemical route or whether you're going to go through a, a bacterial route. And so you can tailor the molecules that come out and you can evolve that over time. So we don't have to worry. I mean, we, there is, there is investment costs, but we don't have to worry about getting locked into a given product. So if we say, Oh, you know what? It's as was recently pointed out, shipping fuel is cost competitive right now for the next 20 years. That doesn't mean that that facility is going to be stuck producing shipping fuel. It could evolve. It could start producing chemicals, ethylene, uh, jet fuel, et cetera. And so I think we need to think of those um, charts that show the, the shifting flows in demand for carbon over time and just admit that there's going to be opportunities for um, renewable carbon to enter into the circular economy through biorefineries, but for them to evolve over time. Thank you, Jared. Yeah, I think that's one of the messages that I learned actually through the process that there's a biofuel feedstock turns into a whole range of um, outputs from the biorefinery, not all of which are useful for every sector. So it's not a kind of necessarily either or for 100% of the feedstock. And there's some symbiosis needed between industries or, uh, or uses. Um, I've got Mark and Chess that I can see with hands up. Thank you for using the hand raising function. Um, I've, 
I'm just keen not to make sure that we continue thread. So if one of, does one of you have, um, are, you, are you both coming in on the that point or is it a new point? Same point from me, um, but happy to give way to Mark considering I've already taken up some people's time. So Jess, maybe if you can make your point. Yeah. Yes, you make a br your brief contribution on the old point and then we'll go to Mark's new point. Okay, fantastic. So yeah, just picking up on uh, Stephen and, and um, Gerard again. Um, I think that's really the question that the, uh, the shipping industry should be asking is, is looking to other sectors and the collaboration of the other sectors mm -hmm. and saying, you know, what what can we do to work together that makes the overall overall product from from the bio refinery um, useful for the multiple sectors and how can we work together to one produce something that works and to produce something that brings the cost down um, mm -hmm. and you know recognizing that it, it, you don't just get something out for one sector and um, but what are the processes and what do we need to be focusing on to get to something within the short time frame considering the, the backdrop that you guys um, uh, presented so well at the beginning, considering the backdrop of the of the short term up to 2030, mm -hmm. and and also tailing off towards 2050. What can we be doing within that time frame, working with these sectors, to identify the processes, the, the specific processes that would be useful? Great, thank you, Jester. Yeah, that echoes a lot of what we've heard. Um, but very useful to have it reiterated. Mark. Hi from Sao Paulo. Hi, Hi yes. to Sao Paulo. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, great discussion, um, everyone. Um, yeah, I think uh, the diversity of um, potential products from the bioeconomy is important, but uh, I think we also need to look at uh, the demand side. And I, I was struck by discussions we, we had in the last couple of weeks with a lot of the, um, the, the sugarcane industry and proponents, especially in Brazil, <clears throat> about the vision for where the transport sector as a whole is going. Um, in a lot of the world, we assume, I think uh, those who look at aviation and shipping, there's kind of an assumption that, uh, that land transport has to be electrified um, using uh, largely battery technologies or direct for, for freight, uh, train, uh, transport, rail, perhaps even road um, from the grid. Um, in, in Brazil, we had a, a very different perspective where the ethanol industry uh, spokespeople are very bullish about the continued and expanded use of ethanol as a road transport fuel as well. And they, they call this an alternative form of electrification uh, uh, with a lot of enthusiasm for fuel cells. Um, I, I think we have to, <clears throat> I think there is a bit of a conflict. There, there is room for, um, to some extent, for different, uh, different uses, but I think um, the availability of, um, of biofuel <clears throat> for, uh, for um, aviation and shipping uh, does depend to a large extent on what happens in the rest of the economy. And uh, it, it, I don't know, the, I think in places like Brazil, that is one of the more promising places uh, that has a lot of potential for sustainable biofuels. There is a bit of a crossroads about what happens to road transport. And I think uh, mm -hmm. perhaps we can't be entirely passive in that discussion either. Um, I think we have to be an advocate for uh, and influence public policy choices um, around what happens to the rest of the economy. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. I think we were really keen to be able to have participants with a perspective on Brazil, given its, um, as Stephen was saying, 30, 40 year history in biofuel production and, and the use at scale um, and the sheer size of the country as well and its production capabilities. So um, it's really interesting to hear from from Lavinia yourself and Stephen's perspective on that. So has anyone else got a um, a thought or comment which which kind of focuses in or, or responds to that? Lavinia. Uh, I, yeah, I could add uh, something to what Mark said. Um, I actually I second what he said and I, I would add that um, we do have most of the um, the fleet that is flexible. You can use both, you know, fuels. Uh, we do have a mandate. So 
I do see the, um, you know, the producers here getting very, you know, attached to the fact that, the fact that they, they already have a demand and uh, they do want to keep things this way. So for, from their perspective, it might be too uncertain to um, switch biofuels to a different use since they already have, you know, a, a guaranteed demand. That's one thing. The other thing is the official um, um, estimates and projections uh, they do not um, account for electrification in Brazil happening as fast as in other parts of the world. So I do think that, um, you know, the official uh, public policy is kind of looking into still having biofuels to um, land transportation. So, yes, I completely second what Mark said. Great. Thanks, Lavinia. That was really helpful. Um, to looking at the dynamic, particularly in Brazil, between the already substantial demand from road transportation for biofuels and how that plays out in terms of the future of, of electrification uh, in the country and whether that is going um, to, yeah, the rate of electrification, which might take out some of that demand and make it available elsewhere for shipping, for example, and or aviation. Great, so nice rich discussion around a few topics we've had so far um, on cost, on indirect land use change, on the need for collaboration with other sectors, on the complexities of the actual biorefining process and the inputs and outputs from that. Um, and then around the policy or market frameworks um, for different transportation sectors, particularly through the lens of Brazil. Um, does anyone want to pick up on anything there or anything any of the speakers raised or, or a new point that um, you've got to mind? Um, can I jump in there, Will? Yes. Hi, Rupert. Do you want to just introduce yourself as well? Uh, absolutely. Um, so I'm Rupert Fawcett and I, uh, I'm formerly, uh, formerly worked uh, with Will and Ian at uh, Forum for the Future, um, now an independent consultant I'm here at um, at Will's invitation, so thanks very much. I also uh, worked on the early stages of uh, getting the SSI up and running, so it's uh, good to be back here seeing um, everything moving forward. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of points, a bit of experience. Um, one of the things I did back in the sort of earlier phases of um, biofuels was working extensively with the UK public transport sector. So this is a, a case study, if you like, of uh, introducing biofuels into an industry. Um, so these are uh, the bus and rail operators who wanted to uh, demonstrate and move forward on sustainability on carbon um, and jumped into uh, biofuels and in particular biodiesel, of course, uh, with Gusto. Um, and that was in the phase which, I, which you might refer to in biofuels as being a bit of a level of um, initial or even possibly irrational exuberance. And um, uh, this was before terms like indirect land use change became uh, common currency in the um, in this sector anyway. Um, and I think what, what happened was they jumped in enthusiastically going beyond the, the, the biofuel mandates that already existed in the EU. And then I think they came out of it feeling rather burned when all the various questions around uh, true biofuel carbon balances and indirect land use change, etc. began to uh, surface. So broadly, they they pull back um, and use the same road fuel as anybody else. And I, and I think they um, I think they probably felt they'd gone into it, not they wish they'd known more <laughs> before they went, went into that. So um, so what I what I bring from that to shipping is um, we we really I would think the uh, industry would all want to make sure that we were bringing forward fuels which um, had the best sustainability characteristics and I was pleased to see um, in the, um, I think it was the uh, earlier seminar uh, results that Will shared earlier on that, um, that I don't think there is any of that, that there's some very reasonable, um, some very, a lot of realism in the industry about these kinds of concerns. So, so that's great. Um, but so Ian's slide, and I think the ICCT slide showed, the, showed um, concerns and, and the ICCT slide showed carbon balance um, across a range of fuels. I've seen a number of, um, as many of us have probably a number of other slides on carbon balance and other analyses, 
they vary quite a lot. Um, and, uh, you, know, you know, including indirect land use change or other intermediate usages and that sort of thing, they vary a lot. And it can be quite hard to make a clear case um, that what you've got um, is sustainable at a certain level. So just really to raise the point that that's something that nobody wants to get burned on. And um, how are we to get to a, a story and a level of analysis? Because um, LCA is, is, is complex stuff. It's not that easy. We, a prerequisite really for moving to the sustainable fuel is that we can demonstrate adequately that it is, that it is sustainable and has a certain, um, a, a certain improvement on fossil fuels, you know, that might be 50% um, or, or whatever, whatever the industry chooses. So, um, so that's something that the industry wants to feel, wants to get some, I would have thought we want to get some confidence about. Um, clearly when you're getting to really better sustainable biofuels, they are a subset of wider biofuels. So that your sustainable biofuel feedstock is a bit, um, availability is a bit smaller than um, uh, wider uh, biofuel availability, which brings up the availability issues that were described. And I just wanted to make a point on sector priority, um, which we talked about a good mm. bit so far, um, shipping versus aviation versus road, etc. Um, the UK Climate Change Committee, the main government advisor in the UK on uh, on, on climate and on alternative energy options, um, found in its uh, bioenergy review, this is a few years ago now, it's been refreshed. Um, it, it, it brought out this problem of sector priority very clearly and came up with a hierarchy. And that hierarchy had at the top uh, aviation and shipping and certain um, industrial heat um, applications and very much deprioritized uh, grid electricity and road fuel. So simply because those are areas where there are good alternatives um, in, in electrification and renewables in particular. So. That doesn't get us past the issue of vested interests. Of course, there's a, there's a lot of investments in many parts of the world in road biofuels, but it does demonstrate that um, in terms of the big picture um, of, of climate policy, that there's an argument to be made for shipping um, to get biofuel priority, definitely along with aviation, I thought, um, to, uh, to help secure some of that limited resource. And there's an mm -hmm. argument to be made, I think, against uh, road use of biofuels. Um, so we shouldn't, from that. Mm, great. Thank you, Rupert. Uh, thanks for joining us and making that contribution. Stephen, you got your hand up. Um, I'm interested actually in that sector priority point. I think the other point that we I'd like to get, if there are more thoughts on, is is that uh, that collaboration between industries on on sectors. So it's not just a case of prioritization, but it's about how they work together to grow the finite supply of uh, sustainable biofuels properly as well. But um, Stephen, do you, do you want to come in there? Uh, I'm happy to, but I'm going to have to change hats then and go back to three months ago when I was still with WWF. Um, <laughs> globally, we, we've been working on this for seven odd years around policy frameworks and um, the aviation and shipping industry were the two uh, industries that we prioritized for any form of biofuels or advanced fuels. Mm -hmm. um, purely because, as rightly said, there's no alternatives to them in the, in the immediate future, and, and that these would also only be regarded as transitions um, to a decarbonizing our, our space. And the reason why then we, we also identified RSB as the sustainability criteria, um, is because that governs the indirect land use issues and puts a a target of 60% carbon reductions on, on alternatives, um, which is, I think, where industry should go. And, uh, and uh, I know Gerald would re regard this as well because that gets us be the, below the 50 uh, neatly. Um, but I just also want to highlight that there, there are studies, and this is what RSB and WWF did together, uh, taking the, uh, all the sustainability criteria, land use change, food security, water surety, climate change, in fact, um, migration, immigration, trade uh, requirements to the year 2060 uh, with a stringent, our stringent set of sustainability criteria. And we ascertained that in Africa alone for the aviation space, we could produce somewhere between 30 and 90% of the requirements of aviation jet fuel 
um, that would in turn stimulate over 250,000 jobs and provide enough biofuels for the likes of a shipping industry and ground transport, particularly then focusing on rail in an African context. So what is viable and it's doable and all the rest, um, unfortunately is not economically viable until somebody's willing to invest. And back to Gerald's question, um, statement there, everyone's looking at their own pockets and their own particular industry streams, not realizing that if we can put this together as a collective and mm -hmm. a particular refinery can do, um, have three or four outputs, like we're seeing with Ryzen and, and the likes with second gen opportunities, they're gonna be producing plastic, jet fuel, uh, and about another 30 other byproducts, uh, glycerine and so forth, that'll go to your, your shopping bags and uh, the, your desktop, Apple computers and the likes. So not binary, not linear, uh, integrated and um, getting industries to, to, to wake up to that call. Uh, my last pitch, I have to, because I'm the business development director of RSB, is the sustainability criteria exist. Uh, of the late recent two biggest investments in, in biorefinery scenarios, um, we were working in the background for the last two years and doing this risk assessments to them because our standards do exactly that. It's a risk-based analysis, um, setting targets of that 60% low carbon emission stories. And that's what actually gets the investor on board when they realize that it's, you've taken out the risk by embedding all the sustainability criteria right up front. And we're currently working on another two like that, which I cannot mention, um, but actually driven by the finance uh, sector, looking for security and surety uh, in a, for long-term investments in, in you know, a refinery that pretty much puts you back around about uh, a half a billion to two billion dollars depending on, on on scale great thank you Stephen that's really insightful and uh, shows also that one of the lessons we had from particularly our sustainability conf, uh, seminar was about the localization or regional picture is really important and the local context is is critical to understanding sustainability and availability is not a or of course you can add up the global picture in the tropics or where there's low demand locally, uh, it, it makes a big difference to what you can actually do with the bioresource you have in a sustainable fashion. Um, a, a huge one. And just to let the, everyone know that we're busy, we did that assessment with IASA and we're um, have just, uh, we're going into the next phase to do that for uh, South America as well, the whole, the whole continent assess it. So we'll have that data ready within the next nine to 12 months. Great, thank you very much. Um, we've got about five minutes left for discussion or questions. Has anyone um, got any further points they would like to make, take a different angle, or just give their um, organizational perspective on this issue? It doesn't have to be linked to anything you've heard before. It's just great to hear from stakeholders generally. Okay, well, um, we could then go on to pose our final question. Um, we would like you to use the group chat function just to give us your answers to this question, which we've been collecting from all the stakeholders we invited to the seminars we had so far, um, just to help us frame the, um, the messages coming out of this project and advice to the industry, which is, we've agreed is going to be critical. So uh, if you want to make it a private contribution, please do. You can message me directly just by changing the two from the drop down list to Will Dawson and you send it to me privately. That's no problem at all. So really it's just asking you what one key piece of advice would you give to the shipping industry regarding biofuels and the future use of, of biofuels um, so if you want to just have a think about that and drop it into the chat that would be that would be really helpful for us
So if you could, if you have that ready, just if you could pop it into the Zoom um, chat function, which you should see at the bottom of your screen if you haven't seen it already, a little speech bubble, and then just answer that question to us in text. That would be great. So it's the key piece of advice you give the shipping industry regarding biofuels. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, Sasha, you messaged me. Um, do keep putting them in. Thank you to say, you want to say it. if you could say, would like to say a few words from your perspective in the ISCC, if you want to just introduce yourself and that to um, contribute whilst people are thinking about that question as well. That'd be, that'd be wonderful. Yes, hi. Uh, thanks for uh, the introduction. I'm uh, Sasha from uh, ISCC, the International Sustainability and uh, Carbon Certification. I'm uh, new to the uh, discussion um, and, uh, well, not new to the biofuel sector because I've been involved uh, since 2011 um, uh, developing ISCC as uh, one of the market leading schemes for certifying uh, at the moment the road transport sector, but also uh, increasingly other markets like the chemical uh, sector or other applications. Mm -hmm. um, so what, uh, what I want to add is that um, we have uh, the experience and the tools, uh, they are already there. And uh, I think this uh, basically the certification when it comes to the sustainability of the, of the biofuels is already there. We, we already have the tools that we need. Uh, this can come from the RSB, this can come from the ISCC, uh, this actually does not matter. Uh, what is important is that it is applied and um, the ISCC approach so far uh, that we have taken for this is uh, when we have um, and, well, engaged with new markets or new applications is that we simply have uh, contacted uh, relevant companies and done a pilot project. Uh, to see what could be burdens from the certification uh, perspective and um, from the cost perspective when analyzing or looking at the costs for certifying the, sustain the actual sustainability of the feedstock. Um, we have found that this is a marginal uh, extra cost. Um, however, I fully agree that uh, this needs to be uh, discussed on the market and certain incentives need to be set. Um, also on the regulatory side uh, to promote uh, if regulators want to promote uh, biofuels also in other sectors than the road transport sector. So we have a certain uh, experience in the European uh, transport sector and are also increasingly uh, engaged with the aviation sector, with the maritime sector. And basically what I'm saying is from a certification perspective, we have everything that we need. Uh, we have more than 3,000 certified companies, mainly for the road transport sector, but from a feedstock supply uh, view, this does actually not make any, any difference. So uh, it is basically just a decision uh, of, of the market. Um, who, whoever wants to, wants to be the driver for this, uh, this could be, could be the market uh, themselves, regulators, uh, or other stakeholders, um, but when the decision has been made uh, from a certification perspective, this is nothing new. This can be done in a, on a relatively short notice. And uh, as I said, what we have done so far is simply start with pilot projects and uh, look at the specific challenges uh, for, that may be specific for the market. And I think uh, when it comes to sustainability of the feedstocks, um, yeah, I just want to point out that uh, there are different schemes on the market um, mm -hmm. that could be, could be used for this. Great. Thank you very much, Tasha, for that uh, very useful contribution. So we've just got two minutes left. I've got um, some nice contributions coming in on the group chat. Um, thank you very much for those. A couple of people emailing, uh, messaged me privately, which is great too. 
if you're still thinking um, as we close the webinar uh, for a few minutes time then uh, and you'd like to make that contribution you can always email myself I'm just going to put my email address up there as well um, to make further contributions so I'm going to draw the discussion section to a close there and just really thank um, our three speakers very much for preparing your presentations and to everyone else for either um, staying with us and listening to us so uh, attentively and to those who made the discussion a really rich one which um, brought some new perspectives definitely to the first two seminars we've held so that's really um, very useful for us indeed for the inquiry we're going through. Um, in the chat section um, Nicole the communication manager from SSI has put in the links to the website for the inquiry and specifically for the event at New York uh, Climate Week which is going to be on the role of uh, sustainable biofuels and dec decarbonizing shipping. If you're going to be at Climate Week um, please do register and promote it to your networks as well um, to your interest in attending. Um, we are looking forward to that very much and thank you very much all indeed. I'm just going to hand over to Andrew now to uh, just say a few remarks of for closing us up at the end of the webinar as well. Over to you Andrew. Thank you Will and I echo Will's comments there on thanking everybody for giving their time this afternoon and your seminars also. So thanks very much. Uh, we definitely had a lot of great and new perspectives and inputs today. And it is about uh, our journey on hearing and learning um, different perspectives from different stakeholders in different sectors on whether or not biofuels has a role and if so, in what sort of shape and form. We are on our journey. Uh, we will take this into our preparations for the Climate Week event and obviously into our um, production of our report, which will be published later this year, within the end of 2019. Um, as Will said there, if you have any comments, thoughts afterwards, please email those to Will um, so we capture them and, and don't lose them so this is not the end. Uh, and just one reflection is that SSI, as you can probably tell from these seminars and what we are actually doing is that we do not have a position on whether biofuels is or is not a viable alternative. We are convening this debate to understand the voices across the sectors, across industries and policymakers, um, so we can form uh, an outcome of whether this is or isn't in the minds of, of others. So we look forward to our event, as, as uh, Will says there, and we encourage you to amplify the message of SSI's journey Thank you, Gerard, for your kind comments earlier on SSI's engagement on this subject. And as uh, Nicole has posted there, the links to our pages, and please register your interest and uh, we will follow up with that. So again, thanks very much for all of your time um, at the end of the day for some and the beginning of the day for others. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Andrew. And so that's it. Thank you very much for joining us. We're going to draw the meeting technically to a close and um, and uh, I hope you have a pleasant rest of the day however long it, it might be wherever you are in the world so thank you from us Great. Bye all. thanks all cheers thanks everyone bye 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 thanks all bye thanks mom <laughs>